Good afternoon, and thank you for tuning in to this week's policy discussion on Do Women Need the Equal Rights Amendment? My name is Sophie Trunetsky, and I'm the Campus Program Fellow here at the Network of Enlightened Women. And I'm so excited to be joined today by Inez Stepman for this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us, Inez. I'm happy to be here and always happy to, to work with new. You guys uh, have some great resources for college students. Inez is a Senior Policy Analyst at the Independent Women's Forum. She's worked in education policy for seven years and prior to joining IWF was the Director of Education and Workforce Development at the American Legislative Exchange Council. Stepman's research focuses on educational reform, school choice, and the cultural impact of empowering parents with control over their children's education. So the way today's policy discussion is going to talk, go is I will ask Inez a few questions and then we'll open up questions to the audience. So Inez, what is the Equal Rights Amendment and why is it something that we should care about as women? So um, when I get asked questions like this, I, I want to actually step back and give a little bit of the history of this amendment. It has a long one, um, and I, I think it's very interesting the way that the amendment has either advanced or been rejected um, with various movements in American history. So uh, it was first proposed by a suffragette, Alice Paul, um, in 1923. So this amendment is almost 100 years old, uh, but it didn't gain any political steam until the 60s. And, and largely the reason for that was the labor movement um, that, that uh, FDR famously championed um, and Eleanor Roosevelt as well. So Eleanor Roosevelt very much opposed the Equal Rights Amendment because uh, they saw it as a danger to some of the labor regulation um, and laws that they were passing in the 1930s and 40s. For example, that women couldn't work longer than 55 hours a week or they couldn't lift a certain over a certain amount of tonnage and an employer could not require them to do that. Uh, and so those laws were in many ways the vanguard of the labor movement. And so the labor movement found the ERA to be um, a dangerous piece of legislation and, and they were very much opposed to it, including Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, so fast forward to, to the 60s and early 70s, um, the amendment regains a whole lot of steam. So it looked like in the early 70s, it was inevitable that this Equal Rights Amendment was going to be written into the Constitution and had the support of both political parties. It was in the Republican Party platform and in the Democratic Party platform. Um, it had passed two thirds uh, of the Senate, two thirds of the House. Um, they had placed, importantly, uh, a deadline of 1979 for ratification, but it passed uh, in the early 70s with the required two thirds and it was sent to the states for ratification. Um, so all of this is to set the stage uh, for, for a lady named Phyllis Schlafly. If you've seen Mrs. America, the series, um, you'll, you'll know something about the, the debates and the clashes that happened over this amendment during the 1970s. But Phyllis Schlafly was the first conservative to come out and say, this is not a good idea. So remember, the backdrop of this is that all previous presidents, living presidents, including Republicans, had said this was a good idea. Um, and it was in the party platform. So it took one brave woman to step forward and say, this is not a good idea. Um, we cannot treat men and women exactly the same because men and women aren't exactly the same. And it's going to actually be bad for women, women if we pass this amendment. And her arguments resonated. She brought out, you know, in, by some counts, millions of, of um, especially women who are wives and mothers who are staying at home. And they essentially stopped this huge political machine in its tracks. Um, and, and throughout the 70s, the numbers of states dwindled that were ratifying it. It edged pretty close. It got up to 35 states. But then actually some of those states went ahead and rescinded their ratification. So we have five states who said, no, 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 we didn't realize what this would do to the Constitution. Um, we take it back. We rescind our ratification. So that's where it stood. And all of the history books essentially wrote, Phyllis Schlafly killed the ERA. Um, now, fast forward to 2016, you had two more states actually ratify, right? Nevada and Illinois. Um, and that set up a big battle about that 38th state, which eventually became Virginia. And the House um, voted to dissolve its previous deadline. Now we can get into some of, of the legal issues here in terms of the ratification process. So this is a highly irregular ratification process happening over decades and decades, uh, ignoring states who have rescinded their ratification, but counting states um, that, that ratified 40 years ago alongside states that ratified this year. So there's, there's a lot of, of legal chow chow to get into um, in the ratification process. Um, but fundamentally, my argument against ERA uh, has a lot in common with Phyllis Schlafly's. She pointed out that men and women are in fact different. 
we have legal equality in this country already. And, and indeed in polls, you see you know, 90%, 95% of Americans uh, support legal equality between men and women, right? Under the law, we're equal. And that concept is already enshrined. It's enshrined in the constitution where nobody suggests, for example, that women don't have the right um, to, to speak, to speak freely as much as, as anyone can these days, but to, to speak freely, to have a trial by jury, um, to, to bear arms, right? Our, our uh, Equal Protection Clause protects women from um, irrational discrimination, right? Uh, it protects women from being discriminated against simply because they're a woman uh, when that fact is not relevant to whatever uh, a woman is trying to do, right? Whether that's you know, enter a law school um, or, or uh, work for government or anything else. So uh, we have those protections in the Constitution. We have federal protections, federal law forbids sex discrimination, um, and then all 50 states forbid sex, sex discrimination. Okay, so against that backdrop, what does the ERA actually do, right? Uh, this, this looks like pretty ironclad legal equality for women. What I fear it will do um, is move us from that legal equality into a sort of harsh, rigid legal regime where the law can't recognize those few situations in which it's actually extraordinarily important to, rec to, to recognize the differences between men and women. And I'll give you a few of those. Um, for example, common sense tells us we need to separate men and women in prisons, right? Um, women are uniquely physically vulnerable if they're put into a prison population with men. Public universities separate men's and women's track teams. And a lot of these things will start sounding familiar when you're talking about the transgender debates, right? Um, because essentially we're talking about small number of exceptions of people who say they're, they're born one sex, but they say they're another sex and they want to, let's say you're born a man, but you want to run the women's track team uh, because you now say that you identify as a woman. Those are a number of exceptions that would essentially become moot under the ERA uh, because you wouldn't have to identify as a woman to run on the women's track team. You would just say, I'm a man, it's a discrimination based on sex to keep me off the women's track team, and that's unconstitutional under the ERA. So a lot of these, these issues will, will resurface in the transgender context, in the context of the, the Bostock, or Bostock uh, decision. We were talking about this off air, I'm not sure how to pronounce the guy's name. Um, a lot of these, these issues will resurface uh, in the context of the Equality Act and this recent decision um, and under the ERA. Uh, because they all have to do with common sense ways in which we recognize that men and women are different. And I fear the ERA would take away our ability to do that. I think that's a long answer to a very uh, general question, but uh, hopefully some of that history is, is helpful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I definitely had no idea about half of this stuff before looking into all this. So I think that was definitely very helpful for everyone to hear and brought up a lot of interesting points that I think the majority hasn't even thought about. Um, the next question is, how are women already equal in the eyes of the law? Which you touched on a little bit, but if you go into a little bit more depth of that. Right. So as I said, um, we, we were talking about the Equal Protection Clause. Um, so this is a large part of this. Uh, the legal battle will be about what standard of scrutiny um, to use. And that's a term of art uh, under the law and, and in the Supreme Court, right? So um, we're talking about what, how, essentially, how good a reason does the state or the federal government have to give in order to make a law that, that treats men and women differently, right? Um, and, and everybody agrees that they can't put forward a law that treats men and women differently just because, right? Um, you know, men, you get, uh, you, you get the, the blue chips, women get the red chips, you know, whatever. I, I, you can think of a, a gazillion silly examples in which that, that might be true. Um, but what that flexibility under the Equal Protection Clause and, uh, has that an ERA may not have um, is the ability for the state to advance and say, yes, I have a really good reason. I don't have a really good reason, um, you know, to, to give women the, the red chips and men the blue chips, but I do have a really good reason to keep men and women separate in prisons. I do have a really good reason to separate boys and girls locker rooms in public schools, right? I do have a really good reason, for example, um, to, to institute uh, programs and programs to battered women's shelters, even though those battered women's shelters refuse to admit men. Those are really good reasons why we might separate men and women and treat them differently. And right now, under our law, those, uh, those instances are treated as good enough reasons for the state to recognize those distinctions between men and women. 
under the ERA, we don't know, uh, but certainly it could be interpreted as, as eliminating those kinds of reasons and raising it to what's called heightened scrutiny, which is the level that the Supreme Court treats distinctions on the basis of race, right? Uh, there are virtually no, the only exception is affirmative action. Um, and that's supposed to be temporary. So we'll see what happens when the 25 years are up on that. Uh, but, but there are virtually no instances in which the state is allowed to make a law that treats, for example, black and white American citizens differently. Um, so a lot of people would argue that the ERA would raise men and women to that same standard. And I, I think that's inappropriate for a large number of reasons, um, but particularly because men and women actually are different. Right, um, and, and the differences are more than superficial. Uh, there's actually an amazing new study that came out a couple years ago that showed that uh, you can actually tell uh, an infant in the womb, you can tell uh, if, if it's a boy or a girl by doing a brain scan in, in terms of, so you can actually tell that men and women's brains are different while they are still in utero. Um, now that doesn't mean that you know women are, are dumber than men or, or incapable of it, like they're, they're um, they're different, right? Our brains, for example, recognize peripheral, um, women's peripheral vision is better than men's. Men's forward-looking vision is better than women's on average, right? Um, so there are, are thousands of these, these actual differences between men and women, and they lead to men and women in a free country making very different choices about how they want to live their lives on average, and that is fine. There is no reason to freak out um, because when you look at, for example, all salaries, uh, of men and women um, on, on average, which is where that 77 cents on the dollar statistic comes from, um, that doesn't take into account hours work. It doesn't take into account different majors, which men and women choose on average differently in colleges, right? Um, it doesn't take into account years that women exit the workforce to take care of their kids by choice. Um, so it, it doesn't account for all those choices that on aggregate women make differently from men because we're different. And what I fear is a legal regime that actually pushes back and, and makes smaller the number of options that women have available to them. When now in 2020, women have an extraordinary range of options and extraordinary amount of freedom under an ERA, we might actually have less of that freedom, that freedom to actually be different and make different choices than men do. So it sounds like there is a lot of disadvantages to this. Is there any advantage to why the ERA could actually help women? So proponents, uh, depending on which side of, of uh, the sort of divide between the legal proponents and the activists you sit on, they make totally different arguments. So if you talk to the legal proponents um, and, and the lawyers involved with this, this uh, ratification um, process, they will say that exactly what I just said, it'll raise um, sex discrimination to the level of, of race, i.e. heightened scrutiny, which comes with all of the problems that I just articulated, right? Um, we can't, for example, segregate prisons by race. That would be unconstitutional. So if it's, if sex is going to be raised uh, to the same level, same heightened scrutiny as race, then presumably we can't have sex segregated prisons, which would be a disaster for female prisoners. Um, so so that's bad enough. So but that's that's the legal argument. Um, if you talk to the the sort of activists in the street in favor of the ERA, they will tell you that it, it primarily two big arguments. One, it'll fix the Me Too, to the problems that the Me Too movement was launched to fight, right? I.e. it'll stop harassment. Okay, harassment is already illegal. That's not the problem, obviously. Um, and, and making it unconstitutional isn't going to make, you know, Harvey Weinstein's jail sentence any longer. Uh, but that is one of the arguments that is advanced. And the other that I hear a lot is, is uh, pay discrimination. Now, we touched on this a little bit in the last question, um, but first of all, let me say that, that discriminating between men and women for pay is already federally, uh, illegal under the federal law. Um, it is not legal in any state to pay a woman less because she's a woman for equal work. And when we get into trouble is when we look at these huge aggregate numbers that represent the very different di choices that men and women make, and we assume that it's discrimination um, that leads to differences in pay, when in reality, it's a series of choices that men make differently from women. And in fact, no, none other than the Obama Labor Department actually acknowledged this, despite the fact that, that President Obama frequently used this 77 cent statistic in his speeches, his own Labor Department conducted a major review of all of the scientific literature on pay in 2009 and concluded that the wage gap was almost entirely due to factors like hours, number of hours worked, 
different educational choices, different workforce choices, right? Um, and, and in fact, they concluded that they could not, uh, could, they, they could not really attribute the wage gap to discrimination. So that's the other argument I hear is that um, the ERA will fix uh, wage discrimination. First of all, I, I, I dispute the premise that there is widespread wage discrimination against women in the United States. But even if that were true, it's not going to make it any easier. We already have a federal law. Women can sue if they suspect that they are being paid less because they are women, they already can sue. The ERA is not gonna provide a new mechanism for women to sue their employers. Um, so I, I find both of those arguments to be somewhat of red herrings in the fact that they're, the ERA is not really going to affect either one of those issues, uh, regardless of what one thinks about the underlying premises and whether or not they actually are issues. The ERA isn't actually going to affect those issues one way or the other. Interesting. So you talked about, um, you know, the locker rooms and the prisons. Would this also technically prevent against sororities and fraternities being a thing and like keeping those to their sexes and also like all women's universities, all male colleges, things like that? So the ERA um, is is limited. Uh, the language limits to state action, right? Um, but but part of the problem is that a lot of uh, private institutions get public money. I mentioned battered women, women's shelters that get grants. They, they would be infirm as well because the state would be not able to give them grants directly, right? Um, same thing with public universities. If, if, if it has clubs, for example, like sororities and fraternities, and it's a public university, then yes, I would say, actually, they very well might be in forever or considered unconstitutional. You're going to have to have a, a case in the federal courts about whether or not it's constitutional for, for example, the, the University of California system to maintain sororities. Um, I think this sounds nuts, right? Uh, <laughs> But uh, th this is a very real possible consequence of the ERA because that language, exactly that language that sounds so broad and nice, no discrimination on the basis of sex, is exactly what results um, in, in some of these absurd policy outcomes because the reality is um, we all distinguish between men and women in our ordinary lives. It is common sense in many situations to distinguish between men and women. And it can be nice to have women's clubs, women's sports teams, right? Um, and for that matter, it's nice for men to have fraternities where they can hang out with other men. There's nothing inherently terrible um, about treating men and women differently. It's only a bad thing if it's done with, without any rational reason. And that's what our constitution already protects us from. But it's what the ERA might take away from us. So you keep bringing up like this idea of the sex sameness and things like that. Why is this not something that everyone's talking about when it comes to the ERA? Like, why is this not like these crazy things that we're talking about, why do people even think that this could be a logical amendment to enact? Well, I, I think there's a bit of a bait and switch going on, right? Um, because it's called the Equal Rights Amendment, because the language is so broad, a lot of people read that and they think, great, you know, we're just rubber stamping into the constitution, the regime we already have, um, where men and women are treated equally under the law because they're equal human beings, right? Um, I think a lot of people see the ERA and that's what they think about. Um, and that's why I think that it's had such a deleterious effect, the process issues, uh, where we've had this very shortened amount of time to have this national conversation because they, they did this illegitimate process where they got to keep the 35 ratifications that happened 40 years ago um, and then add three modern ones in the space of two years. We haven't had time to have a conversation about whether or not we want to add this amendment to the Constitution. It took Phyllis Schlafly years to muster her troops um, to, to stop this the first time around exactly by making these kinds of arguments saying there's a lot of unintended consequences of this that you are not considering and might be really bad for women. Uh, this time we haven't had those years to muster the troops. We haven't had the time to have this kind of national conversation, which is why it's so important that we're having it here and elsewhere because uh, that process has illegitimately short-circuited the debate over this. And that's what I'm hoping to bring back. So I am just so intrigued by all of this. And I think one of the first questions that comes to my mind through talking about all of this is how would this affect, you know, maternity leave and flexible schedules for women? Um, so it's hard to say in part because we don't know what courts will do with this, right? Um, it depends on the composition of courts. It depends on how federal judges read this language. Um, but, but 
potentially you could see exactly um, what we talked about this this idea of, of um, equality as sameness actually start to butt up against the preferences of actual women. Um, and we see this a lot in, in the general debates um, about feminism or, or debates about the so-called women's movement um, where we have a group of sort of very left-wing loud voices who claim to speak for women, but then when you actually dig into survey after survey, you find that women do value flexibility in their careers more than higher salary. They, they value being able to take time off um, and time to spend with their families more than, than getting um, a 10% pay bump in a, in a way that men don't. Um, they don't make the same decisions. And that, that's okay. The fact that women are, are more likely to want flexibility from their careers than men are um, and are willing to make trade-offs to make that happen, that is a beautiful thing about freedom, right? Um, by the way, nobody's forcing any woman to do this, right? If, if you want to lean in, um, you're absolutely free to do so. You do not have to settle for flexibility um, in favor of, of pay raises. You can spend every day at the office in a big law firm um, until, uh, until 10 p.m. at night and not have a lot of time for your family or your friends. That is a decision that millions of men make. Um, and, and millions of women make it as well, and they're free to do so. But we shouldn't be worried about the fact that if you add up and aggregate the decisions of all the women, they tend out to, they tend, you know, the average decision tends to be, you know, a little bit different than the average men's decision. I don't know why uh, or how male decision making became the standard to which we peg um, women and, and sort of hold up as, oh, well, if, if women aren't making all the same choices as men are, uh, therefore, you know, they're behind or they're second class citizens it's perfectly fine for us to make different decisions as women. Um, and, and I think workplace flexibility and time off, I think those are a lot of areas in which women often choose to make different decisions than men. And I think that's great. So we have one last question from our audience and it is, if the ERI were to be ratified, would that impact Title IX, especially in the terms of gender separation in sports, which I know you kind of touched on the sports part, but I'm more, personally interested in just like Title IX in general, you know, we hear it so much like the university level. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Sure, um, I have a, a book's worth of thoughts about uh, about the Title IX process and sexual assault on campuses, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll set this aside for a moment. You know, the fact is it's really hard to say what the ERA will impact. So for example, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who is a huge proponent of the ERA, although importantly, she says that it has to start over, the ratification process has to start over. Um, so the, the ERA proponents of this ratification process are actually uh, in contradiction even with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who is a huge proponent of the ERA. Um, but she said that there are thousands of laws in the United States that would be infirm. For example, she suggests uh, spousal social security. Right now, um, women can, and men, spouses can draw, if you're a non-working spouse, you can draw on social security, partial social security, um, on, on essentially the work of your spouse. Um, and, and initially that was a law that was created for stay-at-home wives to draw on their husband's pensions. Uh, they changed the language to make it sex neutral. But uh, so now both non-working spouses who are males and females can draw on sp spousal social security. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg says that's a papering over of essentially a gendered law that violates the equality principle that underlies the ERA. So um, I think you could see thousands of laws, including things um, regarding Title IX, how Title VII are now having a big fight about how to interpret Title VII and sex in Title VII. Um, I think that same fight will be imported into the ERA. If we end up ratifying the ERA, we will then have to have a debate about, you know, gender identity and who counts as a woman. What is it? What does sex actually mean? Is it male or and female, or is it um, identification? Right. So. Um, all of those issues will be imported into the courts, and it's hard to determine, you know, what circuit will go what way on which question. But I generally oppose the idea of putting all of these public policy questions to the courts instead of the American people, which, by the way, the voters in every modern election are majority female. So there's an ironic twist here that the ERA is taking all of these very important public policy decisions out of the hands of a majority female electorate and putting it into the judiciary, judiciary where those voices, women's voices among, <laughs> among the many others in, in this country are not able to be heard anymore on these important public policy questions. So um, whether how it will affect Title IX, I mean, I could give you some speculation, but it's hard to know. <laughs>
Well, Inez, thank you so much for this. This was amazing. I didn't even know half of the stuff that you mentioned. And after hearing about it, I definitely want to read up more on it and also be an advocate against things like this, because I think a lot of people, like you said, hear the words and think it sounds great. But when you get down to the nitty gritty of it all, it really isn't. So thank you so much again for everything. Thank you so much for hosting uh, hosting me here and, and on this important topic. And, and I'm sorry that there wasn't, we weren't able to have a, a new convention in person this, this year, but um, hopefully next year and, and keep up the great work. Yes, absolutely. And thank you all to all of you for tuning in and for leaving your questions and be sure to tune in next time. Have a good one.